Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Shaver. I'm the science lead for the Reef Resilience Network and the host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be one hour long. It is being recorded and the recording will be sent out to our mailing list after the webinar and it will also be posted on our website. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation and there will also be opportunity for additional Q&A online on the Revisilience Network Forum, <clears throat> which is an interactive online community of coral reef managers and experts from around the world. There are two ways you can ask questions during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. The first is that you can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions and we will keep track of those for the end of the presentation. The second way is that you can raise your hand during the Q&A session and I will call on you to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon that's next to the toolbar, that's next to your name um, in, in the toolbar. If you have any technical difficulties such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please let us know by sending us a message in the question box and we'll try to help resolve that issue with you. Today we are really fortunate to have Harry Lova Rosafi Mamun Zirabe as our presenter who serves as the Blue Ventures National Technical Advisor for Livelihoods in Madagascar. Harry will provide a behind the scenes tour of Madagascar's sea cucumber farms with lessons learned and recommendations from more than a decade of practical experience of mariculture. Um, before I turn things over to Harry, we have just a few poll questions to ask you so we can learn a little bit about who is with us in the audience today. Okay, our first poll question for you is, what is your affiliation or sector that you work in, your primary affiliation? You can select from um, private sector, uh, NGO, farmer or direct implementer, government or other. Okay, looks like most have voted. All right, and we have a lot of people in the other category. I hope we can le learn a little more, but um, next to that is NGO at about 30%, private sector, government, and then uh, just 4% as farmers and direct implementers. That's great. We have another question. Are you currently working in aquaculture? Please let us know, yes or no. Okay, looks like most people have voted. And that's a, looks like most people said no, not currently working in aquaculture at 60%, but a lot of people are currently working in aquaculture, which is really, really interesting for us. Are you involved in sea cucumber farming? Please select um, yes or no. All right, let's see what we have here. 77% said no, but 23% of um, those in the audience are currently involved in sea cucumber farming. It's very interesting. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing your responses. That was really um, fun to learn a little bit about you. And now I'd love to turn things over um, to you, Harry, for you to start your presentation. Thanks, Liz, for the introduction. And uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone wherever you are now. Um, yeah, it's good to see many people here today. Um, as already said, my name is Rasaf Momunzerepi here. Um, I'm from Madagascar, uh, one of the biggest marine territories in the Indian Ocean. Um, I've been involved in 
sunfish farming since um, 2017 and I've been working for Blue Ventures uh, since 2018. Uh, for today's webinar, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Blue Ventures and why it is involved in alternative livelihood activities such as aquaculture. After that, I will give you an overview and history of the development of a community based sunfish farm in Madagascar. Then I will share most of the lessons learned, successes as well as challenges through more of an etiquette experience in developing this particular activity. Uh, finally, I will provide some cautionary details to be considered and some recommendations before developing or part, uh, replicating uh, the sunfish farming. To kick off, Blue Ventures is a UK-based marine conservation organization dedicated to rebuilding tropical fisheries with coastal communities. We work with communities where the ocean is vital for them, for their culture, for their economy, and we put them at the heart of all activities. Given that hundreds of millions of people are dependent on traditional small-scale fisheries, for the livelihoods, well, 90% of world's fish stocks are already overexposed or fully exploited. There is a critical need to diversify the livelihoods of coastal populations in order to reduce the pressure on marine resources. The degradation of the marine environment is caused by numerous interrelated factors, which is why our programs in Madagascar encompass locally driven marine conservation, sustainable fisheries management, education, community health, and alternative livelihoods in order to address the interconnected challenges. Uh, when engaged in alternative livelihood activities, communities have access to alternative sources of income. For example, by doing aquaculture, fishermen and fisherwomen become partly farmers, and therefore, they do not depend solely on fishing as a source of income. So the situation allows them to have a financial breathing space to undertake further and broader management of their marine ecosystems. Moving to the second part of my presentation, I will give you an overview and history of the development of community-based sunfish farms in Madagascar. But what is the sea cucumber? Sea cucumber uh, is an animal, and um, um, we count more than 1,000 species of sea cucumbers worldwide, but only about 70 species are targeted in active fisheries. One of these is the species Holotrigia scabra, commonly known as sunfish. So when I say uh, sunfish farming during this presentation, it means Holotrigia scabra, Farming. Sea cucumbers are called trepang or pêche de mer after processing and are in high demand in Asian markets as they are considered a delicacy, a health food and medicine. Sea cucumbers also play an important role in the marine ecosystem as filter feeders. Um, around the world, um, sea cucumbers are harvested and traded. Um, and are exploited in different types of fisheries, uh, industrial fisheries, semi-industrial fisheries, and small-scale fisheries. But most of the uh, um, exploitation is on small scale, uh, which represent more than 60%. Um, and uh, small-scale uh, sea cucumber fisheries represent an important livelihood in coastal communities. In Madagascar, over the last few decades, while sea cucumber population have collapsed as uh, itinerant fishermen have been scoring coastal waters using diving gear to clean the seabed. In Madagascar, uh, in late 90s, a project was set up to farm uh, Olotria scabra, sunfish. So the first uh, sunfish hatchery and then the crowd pilot phase were developed through pilot projects in partnership between universities and private companies. 
uh, reason showed that it was possible to produce juveniles in a hatchery and to successfully grow uh, sandfish to commercial size in sea pens. Sandfish farming shows promise as a sustainable, non-extractive and lucrative alternative livelihood. Um, it can bring a much higher income than if the same area was used for artisanal fishing or cleaning. And uh, a large sandfish is worth around one US dollar. So the sale of a few piece, pieces a day uh, would easily exceed the usual income of most fishermen. And as the supply of wild sunfish continues to decline worldwide, the price is expected to increase. So sunfish farming is clearly an uh, opportunity for coastal communities as it represents a sustainable alternative source of income to fishing. Let me draw your attention to this diagram showing the stakeholders and their roles. Um, the development of a community-based aquaculture model consists of bringing the community together around the aquaculture activity in which farms are owned and operated by the community themselves. The first example of this industry showcases a private company that produces the juvenile sunfish and also buys and processes the sunfish once they have reached maturity. In Madagascar, the first private company um, involved in sunfish farming is called Indian Ocean Trepang and is based in the southwest of Madagascar. As an NGO with an ecological and social motivation, Blue Ventures provides technical support to the farmers. In this way, the farmers are involved in all operational activities, but the farmers are also actively involved in the design and application of the rules dedicated to the management of the resources. Um, the government has a major role to play in securing people and investment, and also with delivering all necessary permits and authorizations. For the history, let's take a look at this next diagram. Um, in 2007, Blue Ventures began a project pilot of sunfish farming. But unfortunately, the lack of technical knowledge led to limited results. However, it allowed Blue Ventures and project partners to have a clearer understanding of the technical aspect of the activity and also to identify the challenges while creating a strong interest from the local community. In 2009, Blue Ventures secured grant funding from a regional program for the sustainable management of the coastal zones and started a second pilot. 40 families were the beneficiaries and sunfish reached harvest size in nine to 12 months. The second pilot was successful. And in the meantime, uh, the Royal Norwegian Society for Development, known as Norgesfell, learned about the potential of the activity. So the possibilities for funding were assessed. The conclusion of this feasibility st study stated that there was a potential for increasing the number of farmers and the scale of the production. So from 2010 until 2019, Norgesel was uh, the supporter of Blue Ventures and other fundings were added in parallel and took over after this long-term funding. The first farming model was gradually designed. Um, towards the end of 2015, there were 40 pens where hundreds of farmers did all related work. Um, in this slide, you can see the first model, first farming model in Tampuluve, where um, uh, many paints of various sizes were, were created. During that time, we, we had a fluctuating harvest. This next diagram shows that uh, several events happened during this first farming model. Um, the second one destroyed the farm in 2013. Uh, chronic theft was an issue and the massive disease decimated uh, the sandfish in 2015 
and the resource shortage of tribunals and fishes in the same year. All these events led us to close the farm in 2016, and we undertake a full evaluation of the model and also uh, made uh, trials. Based on findings and results from assessment and trials, the farms were rebuilt uh, in Tampolouvé and Amulumuke. Uh, but this time with a solid technical and socio-organizational basis, the second farming model was designed for these two sites. Uh, this time we standardized the uh, size of the pen and we stocked monthly and uh, as a uh, result, we, we had a steady harvest. In 2020, uh, the context has changed as our private commercial partners, Indian Ocean Trepang, decided to provide the sandfish juveniles free of charge, but in return, reducing the purchase price of adult sandfish. In consequence, uh, the third and fourth models were designed. The third model is different compared to the second one, um, as we have changed the stocking strategy uh, to reduce costs, um, stocking each quarterly, not each month. Um, and we have integrated uh, an innovation in terms of construction and management of enclosures to ensure the payment of all operational costs. The fourth model runs in parallel with the third model, but is different compared with it. As for the new site in Ansatsamurui, uh, we decided to no longer build many small pens, but rather build one single collective pen. Um, and building just one collective pen also reduces investment costs. On the basis of the good results that we had encountered in the Southwest, the development project of sandfish farming in the Northwest was decided. We needed to bring a new alternative livelihood to mangrove exploitation there. However, we came up against a big obstacle, which is the inexistence of a hatchery. So we had begun discussions with our private partners in the Ocean Trepang, but they were not yet in a position to develop the activity elsewhere. Um, we had then wanted to set up a hatchery in collaboration with the government, but unfortunately, due to a land issue, the project did not succeed. Nevertheless, this has sparked the government's interest in this activity. So currently, the government is looking for another land to set up its own hatchery in the Northwest. After seeing the development of the community-based sandfish farming supported by Blue Ventures in Madagascar, let's now move on to the third part of his presentation about lessons learned. The motivation and professionalization of farmers is one of the major challenges because from the moment the project is introduced to the community until the first harvest and first sale of sandfish, it takes a lot of time. Moreover, events such as cyclones, theft, or disease can occur and disrupt the activity and also have a negative impact on the farmer's motivation. For the professionalization, it takes time because farmers are fishermen and fisherwomen who are not used to long-term strategy and planning. Technical challenges exist, as some aspects of the farming are not yet fully understood. Technical challenges also related to the fact that a model that works elsewhere cannot be fully replicated. And ensuring a steady access to juveniles is totally dependent on the hatchery partner. In terms of governance and security, the issues mainly concern um, the use of the common area, um, the choice to dedicate a part of this area for the farming activity can generate conflicts. Another challenge is to ensure the safety of the farmers and the community, as sunfish are valuable 
and the sunfish farms brings a lot of money, so likely to attract thieves. Sunfish farming cannot be done without uh, being integrated into the management of resources, because on one hand, in an area where the rules of good fishing practice do not exist or are not followed, but practices such as fish poisoning can completely destroy the farms. And on the other hand, if good management rules are not established at the sunfish farm level, the existing resources will be overexploited due to the regular presence of farmers at the farm level. The biggest financial challenge is to secure funding until the activity is profitable and until farmers reach a level of professionalism that can ensure the sustainability of the activity without subsidies. Logistically, the biggest challenge is to access specific aquaculture materials and bring them on site that are usually remote and isolated. The last challenges and not the least are to manage and adapt to periodical or unforeseen events such as cyclones of the COVID-19 pandemic. After seeing the challenges, let us now see the many successes obtained so far. Thanks to the progressive findings and improvements of the farming model, from the second model, uh, the results are clearly good. There was no longer massive disease. The average monthly income per farmer reaches 35.7 US dollars, uh, 60 US dollars in Tampurufe, while the average income per adult in the region is around 36 US dollars per month. The return rate, which means the ratio between the quantity of adults and fish harvested compared to the quantity of juveniles stocked, is also very satisfactory. Uh, because it, reach, it reaches uh, 60%. Finally, all constructions are cyclone-proof. In terms of governance, um, considerable achievements should be noted. The farmers are grouped together at the Sangha Management Committee level. Uh, Sangha, the word for sea cucumber in Malakasi. Um, this Sangha Management Committee grouped the farmers, but also employs professionals to support farmers, and which also includes local decision makers to facilitate all social and environmental decision making. Farmers can access their pens once they sign the lease agreement, which stipulates the technical, environmental, and social rules to be followed. No take zone at the level of uh, sunfish farms where they limited in which it is forbidden to capture other than the sunfish, or actually as capra. Finally, farmers contribute to the payment of the community pot for the development and conservation activities carried out at the level of the entire community. In terms of operational results, uh, farmers are paying the operational costs, such as the Sangha Management Committee, staff salaries and no farmers are in debt. From November 2018 until now, more than 33.5 tons of sunfish were harvested, which represent more than 82,000 US dollars. And more than 200 farmers are involved in this activity with a good gender representativity. Environmentally, the farms are safe areas for marine species because no one touch them as the farms are not zone. And studies in partnership with the University of Edinburgh have also shown that seaweed grow faster in areas with a high population of sunfish. And before being harvested at marketable size, sunfish can reproduce and contribute to the repopulation of the species around the farms. Having seen the lessons learned, now let's start the last part of the presentation concerning the caution and recommendations when developing the community-based sunfish farming. 
as you have probably already noticed, um, some prerequisites are necessary before developing um, any sunfish farming activity with a community. First of all, um, it is essential to set up partnership with an existing uh, sunfish hatchery. And the establishment of a local governance system is necessary to avoid or resolve any conflict. Without access to a favorable habitat, the activity cannot be carried out. And it is necessary to know beforehand the specific parameters of each site to adjust the technical model to be set up. Last but not the least, engaging in, in this activity without sustainable funding until the activity becomes viable would be a mistake. Sunfish farming is still an ascent industry and um, it is not a livelihood option suited to all contexts, communities and environments. And uh, it can present considerable social and environmental risks. The development of this industry could take a precautionary and risk averse approach, particularly about security of the communities. This activity will not solve the many complex challenges facing tropical fishing communities and should never be implemented without an active and well-considered community-led fisheries and resource management practices. This activity should be viewed as a tool to reduce poverty and increase livelihood security for coastal fishers. This last slide ends the last part of the presentation. So, in conclusion, community-based sun fish farming in Madagascar has been shown to be technically feasible for fishermen and women to engage in under certain conditions, of course. Sunfish farming has been shown ecologically, ecologically beneficial, whilst also being a remunerative activity for the community. Um, these factors make sunfish farming a promising maricultural opportunity for uh, coastal communities. However, um, stakeholders involved in the development of a community-based sunfish farming needs to be aware of the difficulties which lie in it, as well as the big opportunity if done well. Developing a model that can succeed needs time, perseverance, and perpetual adjustment. Each site and context needs the development of a specific model, um, as a successful model in one site is not fully replicable but needs to be contextualized and adjusted for success. Sunfish aquaculture will fail without certain prerequisites and key success factors in place. Our Northwest case has shown no difficulties developing this activity without an operational archery. Sunfish model also fits into the wider resource management strategies which involve the communities where the activity is implemented. Time, funding, and partnership are key issues for replication. But the success of the partnership between NGO, private sector, and community was demonstrated, and also the potential of communities to run successful sunfish farms. This concludes my presentation. But before I finish, I would like to thank our many partners and funders without whom this project would not have been possible. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Harry. I really appreciate your, um, your presentation and um, would like now to switch over to the Q&A. Um, let's see, I think we do have, let me just get my attendees list up. We do have a couple of questions coming in um, from the, the, in the question box um, for you. So the first one is, um, why was another farm, um, was, why was another farm not put at um, end of, Vadoaka after the first pilot. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
I didn't really capture the name of the village. Okay. Um, the, the question, I think it was, um, uh, why was another farm not put at um, Andavadawaka? I think I'm saying, I hope I'm saying that correctly, after the first pilot, or was there, a, was there another farm put in that location? Ah, uh, for for the first pilot, um, it was done in the Andavatoka village. Um, yeah, uh, for the story, uh, this Andavatoka village um, uh, was chosen as the first uh, beneficiary, uh, precisely the Women Association there, uh, because um, the Velendrika community managed uh, protected area evolved from the establishment of a successful temporary octopus notex zone by this village uh, in 2004 to a fully fledged marine protected area in 2006. Uh, the Women's Association there um, uh, officially asked the Blue Ventures to create new alternative livelihoods. So when the opportunity to pilot uh, to first pilot the sunfish farming arose. Uh, naturally, the Women's Association was it identified as the beneficiary uh, and the village of Andavatok. But unfortunately, uh, after doing this first pilot, um, um, the sediment was not really suitable for uh, sunfish farming. And uh, at that time, uh, the security system was not really uh, uh, good. So that's why when we uh, decided to do the second pilot, uh, we changed the location into another village. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have, and we have a lot in the question box, and I just wanted to remind everyone that you can ask your question out loud as well. If you raise your hand, then we'll We'll um, unmute you, but you can also ask in the question box. Um, so the next one we have asks, how much time does it take to produce a harvestable adult from a juvenile? Yeah, a really good question. Um, from a juvenile, uh, which is about 15 to 20 gram, um, we grow out uh, the Sand fish uh, on sea pens during nine to 12 months. But it depends on the uh, uh, quality of the sediment. Sometimes it's more than 14 months. Sometimes it's uh, uh, between nine to 12 months. And the um, uh, harvestable size is uh, 400 grams and plus. Okay, great. Um, I have someone asked a couple of questions here. So, um, okay. So the first one is, um, how long did it take to get to financial sustainability without donor subsidy? Um, they also asked, how are beneficiaries identified, and is involvement linked um, to changes in destructive fishing practices or reduction in fishing effort? Um, there's a couple questions there. Maybe we'll just start with the first one about um, how long did it take to get to financial sustainability without needing um, donor subsidy? Yeah, nice question. Um, for this one, um, for our case, um, during the first farming model um, from 2010 to 2015, um, the model was not yet. Uh, uh, like the model we have now. So um, farmers didn't pay uh, all operational costs. Um, they were not really organized. Um, and uh, after the assessment that we did in 2016, uh, all these findings were considered. And when we uh, designed the second farming model, we try to implement all of these findings inside the second farming model. That's why uh, from 2017 uh, until now, um, 
or the operational costs are paid by the farmers, uh, which is one key for the sustainability. Um, farmers are grouped uh, inside the Sangha Management Committee, um, and the Sangha Management Committee employs uh, supervisors to help the farmers. Um, yeah, and the operational costs and salaries of uh, these supervisors are paid by the farmers. So now uh, we can say that uh, the farms can run without uh, subsidies, uh, especially in Tampulufe. Um, but um, um, as I said, uh, each site is different. I think the example of uh, second farm in uh, Abulumuki, um, the habitat is not really uh, good like in Tampulufe. So uh, the cycle for uh, the period uh, for the sea cucumber to reach the harvest stable size is uh, more than 14 months. Uh, so it uh, impacts the farmer's motivation. And we now we are uh, trying to remediate to all of these uh, issues. And uh, compared to the Temple of site, uh, this site is not really um, able to be uh, uh, um, put without our support. But for uh, Temple of site, we can say that uh, since 2018, uh, uh, during the first star fest until now, uh, if we can pay all operational costs, we are more major uh, compared to the uh, period of the first farming model. So uh, to answer this question, uh, how long it is difficult be because uh, we had an interruption during 2016, but we limited to the, uh, all the issues after that. So to give uh, an approximation, uh, we can say uh, not uh, before five years. Okay, great. Um, and then they, this person also asked, how are beneficiaries identified? Yeah, um, for the identification of the beneficiaries, um, from the second uh, farming model uh, since 2017, um, we changed the methodology of uh, uh, beneficiaries identification as uh, villages uh, in the southwest of Madagascar are organized uh, uh, according to the clans. So uh, firstly, we do clan mapping because it's a, a socio-organizational uh, uh, in the southwest of Madagascar. So uh, after uh, doing the clan mapping, we um, we just uh, uh, give to the chief of clans the quota. So they decide uh, inside their clan which one will be the beneficiary of the activity. Um, we changed the identification uh, like this because before uh, we didn't have um, clear methodology. Farmers were just grouped uh, inside team, like teams of uh, uh, teacher and school uh, student. Um, and we encountered uh, some issue about uh, theft because a uh, few clans uh, in the villages were not included uh, inside the farm. And we had encountered uh, many theft. That's why we encountered this uh, chronic theft during the first farming model. But we, after the evaluation in 2016, um, we do clan mapping and we, we include all the clans uh, of the villages where the farm is set up. So now uh, all the clans are integrated uh, and we have the buy-in of the community. So no more theft until now. 
Great. Thank you, Harris. Oops, I did not mean to advance my slide there. Um, okay, so we have a, a couple of questions about um, where the um, the sea cucumber juveniles came from. Was there a particular hatchery that you used, um, or were they purchased, or were they kind of grown locally? Mm, yeah. Uh, for the juvenile sunfish, um, as already said, uh, we work with a hatchery partner, a private hatchery partner um, in the southwest of Madagascar. The private company is called the Indian Ocean Tree Fund, and um, um, they progressively um, built this hatchery. Uh, because they did some research in the late 90s, they, they found the technology for uh, reproducing artificially the sea cucumber, the sunfish. And uh, our community uh, buy, um, buys uh, juvenile sunfish from this uh, private hatchery. Um, but uh, since uh, last year, uh, since uh, mid 2020, uh, Indian Ocean Trade Bank decided to provide the juveniles free of charge to the community. But in return, uh, they decided to reduce the purchase price of the adult sea cucumber. So uh, for all of our farms, the juveniles uh, come from this hatchery. Great, thank you. We have a number of questions asking about the disease that you mentioned um, that happened in the first pilot. Um, mm. So uh, people were wondering what the name of the disease was, if, if you know, um, or causes mm. of, of the disease, um, mm. and whether you think this is, um, you know, just related to farming um, or whether it, it happens in the wild as well. Mm, yeah, uh, the disease is called uh, skin ulceration disease. Um, it is the only known disease uh, that infects the sun, uh, farm sunfish. Uh, in the wild, we didn't see uh, uh, this kind of disease, but it is just uh, uh, for farm sunfish. And the symptom of this disease is the skin ulceration. Um, it is just uh, white, like a white spot in the skin of uh, sunfish, but it can end with uh, evisceration of the animal and its death. So, yeah, in, as said, uh, this disease seriously affected our farms in 2015. Um, but uh, from the second uh, farming model, um, we monitor this disease, but we we didn't uh, find so many like uh, during the farming model. Um, the figures uh, that I have now is around 0.7% of uh, theoretical stock uh, during last year were affected by the disease, um, which is negligible as uh, this disease is, will always happen every year um, due to the change in water temperature between the warm season and the cold season. And uh, uh, a recent paper uh, from a uh, research done uh, with sunfish in Madagascar has revealed the seasonality of the disease. The maximum peak occur, uh, occurs in winter time. And uh, uh, the analysis of the integumental cells uh, showed that the sea cucumbers uh, react by forming a collagen fiber plug. Um, the analysis also revealed the higher proportion of uh, fibrionacy uh, bacteria in ulcers uh, in comparison to the healthy integument of the same individuals. Uh, but uh, experimental infection assays were performed uh, with uh, crude extracts of the ulcer and bacteria. Um, but did not significantly reduce uh, skin ulceration. So the results uh, suggest that the disease is not induced by a pathogen, um, or uh, at the very last uh, least 
um, that the pathogen is not found within viral cells as the disease is not transmissible by contact. Uh, so it was not the uh, bacteria who is responsible for the ulcer. The ulcer is caused uh, by the uh, change in temperature and the bacteria uh, stick into the ulcer after. Uh, that's what we know uh, from now about this uh, skin ulceration disease. Great, thank you. And your response segue, segues really well into some other questions about climate change and um, how you see ways in which these farmers um, and sea cucumber farms in general can prepare for a changing climate or, or whether there's things that are already being done. Mm, yeah. Um, during the first farming model, um, uh, a cyclone occurred uh, in the southwest of Madagascar and uh, destroyed the farm. Um, that's why when we uh, made some improvement uh, with uh, the second farming model, we construct a farm uh, uh, in order to the farm to uh, be able to uh, face the cyclone. And we know uh, climate change can uh, impact on the periodicity and the strength of the cyclone. So that's one thing we did. Um, and uh, since 2017, we had uh, uh, many cyclones, but until now the farms is, uh, <laughs> is there, no destruction anymore. Um, for sea cucumber, uh, it's difficult to say um, uh, what will be the impact because um, sea cucumbers uh, uh, um inside uh, the sediment. If the climate, uh, if the temperature is uh, high, uh, surely it will impact uh, the sea cucumber. Uh, but we, we don't have enough data to, uh, to confirm it or, uh, yeah. So, uh, about the sea cucumber, uh, we, we just doing uh, the best we can uh, in preparing to the climate change, but uh, we don't have enough data. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions asking about um, how you, uh, how how the group dealt with. Um, theft and, and poaching and how um, whether there were any bylaws that were created for the no-take zones or any specific actions that were taken to make the, the zones um, successful in being no-take zones? Mm, yeah, really good question. Um, as I mentioned during the presentation, um, um, it is difficult to uh, farm sunfish without uh, um, the integration of uh, activity into the broader management of the resources. Um, yeah, uh, we in the southwest um, we have the Felundica Association. Uh, which is the association responsible for the uh, marine protected area there. So um, all the farmers and the Sangha Management Committee are included inside this uh, big Philodic association responsible for the MPA. Um, of course, this association uh, has its, uh, its bylaw and uh, has its regulations and um, all of the farmers and the Sangha Management Committee uh, needs to comply with all these regulations. So uh, for the Notex zone, um, it is the Sangha Management Committee and the Fairyungika Association uh, who decided to uh, delimit the farm as a Notex zone. That's why it's successful because all the community uh, is involved in 
securing this notic on not only the farmers but all the community inside the Philentica Association. And we also have uh, what we called uh, lease agreement. Um, this lease agreement is a document um, which stipulates um, all rules um, in order to farm and all the obligation uh, for the compliance with uh, um, Fairundica Association's regulations. And each farmers uh, need to sign this lease agreement before acceding to uh, the farm. Great. Thank you. Um, a few questions about um, the market around um, around this aquaculture product. Um, what's the what are the um, major markets that um, they're selling these the sandfish to? And did, does the local community, for instance, also eat the sea cucumbers, or are they uh, mainly exporting them? Yeah, uh, Malagasy uh, doesn't eat sea cucumber. <laughs> yeah, um, all of the product uh, goes to Asian market. Um, yeah, we have uh, in the southwest, not only in the southwest, but uh, uh, along the coast of Madagascar, we have many, many uh, local collectors. Um, uh, they are linked with uh, Chinese collector and Chinese exporter. Uh, so all the product goes to Asian market. Uh, for us, uh, with our model, we uh, work with Indian Ocean Trade Bank. So all the product goes to uh, Indian Ocean Trade Bank factory. They, process, they, uh, they do the final process of uh, uh, sandfish into Trade Bank uh, or Pêche de Mer. So after that, they export all of the products uh, uh, in the Asian market. Thank you, Harry. And um, is this farming a supplementary income? Um, is it often the sole income for some of these farmers? Um, sort of getting at the question of alternative livelihoods and um, and, and whether these are um, supplemental or uh, additional incomes and, and whether there's still a lot of um, traditional farming practice, uh, sorry, traditional fishing practices still occurring. Yeah, um, um, fishers, um, fishermen and fisherwomen, they capture uh, sea cucumber even before we started farming uh, uh, sunfish. Um, in Madagascar, there are around uh, uh, 30 species which are uh, targeted by fishermen. So before they, uh, and even now, the, uh, fishermen and fisherwomen capture uh, sea cucumber in the wild. Uh, so it's part of their uh, income from fisheries. Um, for us, um, it is an alternative livelihood because um, um, we um integrated all the uh, fishermen and fisherwomen in our farms in their farms so um instead of uh overfishing they have this activity which uh, brings uh secured income for them uh, monthly income so they are more income secure and this is uh, an alternative to fishing. That's why we implemented this activity in the southwest of Madagascar. I think we have time maybe for one, one last question. Um, and uh, this question is getting more about uh, the technicalities of, of how you do sea cucumber farming, um, asking mm -hmm. what depths of water are practical and what are the characteristics um, of good quality sediment or sand or um, the environment or, or habitat. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, about suitable habitat. Mm, yeah, um, an optimal sunfish farming site is uh, characterized by the, uh, some biophysical factors. Um, uh, the area needs to be sheltered area, protected from high energy waves, um, like bay. So um, the area also need uh, to have water coverage, even at low water springs. And uh, the area needs to be accessible by foot during spring tide, during the low tide, as all the related work are done during the low tide on spring tide. Um, the sediment um, of the area uh, needs to be a fine sediment uh, and have at least 15 centimeters uh, depth. So above the rock below, we have at least 15 centimeters. Um, the, one of the best indication of a suitable habitat uh, is the presence of seagrass meadows. Um, yeah. So if if we have all these factors uh, characteristic, so we have a suitable habitat for sandfish farming. Great, thank you so much, Harry, for answering all those questions. And we we have quite a few more. Um, and so if it's okay with you, Harry, uh, maybe we can try um, to see how many of those we can answer just in, in a Word document after this webinar and submit mm -hmm. to the, um, we can post it to the Reef Resilience Network forum. So anyone in the audience who asked a question it didn't, and it didn't get answered during this webinar, um, you can go check there. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, We'd be so happy we, to answer. Yeah. That would be great. Um, and we do have a number of resources up on this slide um, for anyone that wants to learn more. There's a sandfish farming toolkit provided by Blue Ventures, um, a blog um, more about this community led aquaculture project, the Reef Resilience Network, um, and working with um, Blue Ventures. Um, we have a case study all about um, sea cucumber farming um, and the as we mentioned, the Reef Resilience Network Forum, the link um, is provided there, which again is a kind of a, a discussion space for people to meet other scientists or managers or practitioners and, and ask questions and learn from each other. Um, and um, with just two minutes left, I, I wanted to thank Harry again so much for that great presentation. I wanted to thank everyone in the audience for attending and for asking some really great questions. Um, and um, we hope to hear more from you and hope that um, we can provide some extra answers to your questions um, as well in the next few days. So thank you Thanks, very much, Liz. everyone.